Hello students, welcome to this new video lecture on system of particles and rotational motion given in chapter number 7 of physics for class 11. In our earlier videos, we primarily considered the motion of a single particle, that is a particle which was ideally represented as a point mass having no size. We applied the results of our study even to the motion of bodies of finite sizes, assuming that the motion of such bodies can be described in terms of motion of a particle. But in our daily life, we encountered bodies of finite sizes. In dealing with the motion of extended bodies, that is the bodies of finite sizes, often the idealized model of a particle is inadequate. In this chapter number 7, we shall try to go beyond this inadequacy. We shall attempt to build an understanding of motion of extended bodies. Then what is an extended body? An extended body in its first place is a system of particles. We shall begin with the consideration of motion as a whole. The center of mass of a system of particles will be the key concept here. We shall discuss the motion of center of mass of a system of particles and its usefulness in understanding the motion of extended bodies. So, in this video, we will first introduce the system of particles and rotational motion followed by center of mass and then motion of center of mass and finally we will conclude this video with our discussions on linear momentum and system of particles. So I welcome you once again. If you feel that I am going very fast, please pause the video and note down all the important points. I welcome you once again. A large class of problems with extended bodies can be solved by considering them to be rigid body. A rigid body is a body with perfectly definite size and unchanging shape. A rigid body is a body that can rotate with all parts locked together and without any change in its shape. The distances between all pairs of particles of a such sphere body do not change. In practice, it is observed that the real bodies such as wheels, tops, steel beams, molecules and planets deform under the influence of forces. But in many situations, the deformations are negligible. In a, in a number of situations, we can ignore the twist, bends or vibrations and treat them as rigid. Motion of rigid bodies. First is translational motion. Before that, let us ask one question. What kind of motion can a rigid body have? Let us try to explore this question by taking some examples of motion of rigid body. Let us begin with a rectangular block sliding down an inclined plane without any sidewise moment. It is shown in the figure A here. This block is taken as a rigid body. Its motion down the plane is such that all the particles like P1, P2, etc. move together. That is, they have the same velocity at any instant of time. The rigid body here is in pure translational motion. In pure translational motion, at any instant of time, all particles of the body have the same velocity. Consider now 
the rolling motion of a solid metallic or wooden cylinder down the same inclined plane as shown in the figure B. Here the points P1, P2, P3, P4 are moving with different velocities. And it shifts from the top to bottom of the inclined plane and thus seems to have translational motion. But since all its particles are not moving with the same velocity and instant of time, the body is therefore in not translational motion. Its motion is translational plus something else. Rotational motion. In, in the case of rotational motion, the body rotates around a fixed axis where every particle of the body moves in a circle as shown in figure C above. Here, OZ is the axis of the rotation, axis of rotation, and the circular paths are shown here with center C1 and C2 and R1 and R2 are their radius respectively. Points P1 and P2 describe a circle with the respective centers C1 or C2. R is the perpendicular distance of the point P1 and P2 from the axis. The point P3 remains stationary as it lies on the axis of rotation. These circles lie in a plane perpendicular to the axis and has its center on the axis. The examples of rotational motions are a ceiling fan, a potter's wheel, a giant wheel in a fair, and merry-go-round and so on. Another example of rotational motion is a table fan. The pivot of the fan is point O. This is the pivot of the table. This is point O is fixed. This is fixed. The blades of the fan are under rotational motion. The blades rotate round and they are under rotational motion. Whereas the axis of the rotation of the fan blades is oscillating. The fan, this is the axis of oscillation when the fan goes round and blade axis, blade is rotate about the axis, axis of rotation. The third example of kind of rotation is top spinning in place. Here it is a top spinning place and so it does not have translational motion. Here O is fixed. We know from the ex our experience that axis of such a spinning top moves around the vertical through its point of contact with the ground sweeping out the cone as shown in figure E. The moment of the axis of the top round vertical is term precision. Here the top is precision. Note that the point of contact of the top with the ground is fixed, that is O is fixed. Combination of translation and rotation. The motion of a rigid body which is not pivoted, underlined, not pivoted or fixed in some way is either a pure translation or a combination of translation and rotation. The motion of a rigid body which is pivoted or fixed is rotation. Hence, note the difference between rotation, translation and combination of translation and rotation. The rotation may be about an axis that is fixed or moving. 
that that means axis can be fixed or it can be made not moving let's see the figure f above in this figure motion of a rigid body which is pure translation here at any point of time at any instant the velocities of any particles like o and p of the body are same in pure translation since it is a pure translation the point o and p1 have the same velocities and the angle alpha between the horizontal and the axis of fixation alpha 1 alpha 2 and alpha 3 are same in next figure g on the right hand side which illustrates a combination of translation and rotation in this case at any instant the velocities of O and P are different. The angles alpha 1 is not equal to alpha 2, alpha not equal to alpha 3. That means alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 as well as velocities of O and P are different. Hence these are combination of translation and rotation. In this chapter, we consider rotational motion about a fixed axis only. Center of mass The center of mass of a system of particles is a point where all the mass of the system is concentrated and all the external forces are applied. Consider two particles M1 and M2 located on x-axis at a distances of x1 and x2 respectively as shown in the diagram. O is the origin that is the intersection of y-axis and x-axis. To find the center of the mass of the system which is at the point C here as shown in the diagram and located at a distance of capital X is given by X is equal to M1 X1 plus M2 X2 divided by M1 plus M2. This is for two particles. If M1 is equal to M2, then X is equal to X1 plus X2 divided by 2. Therefore, if the number of particles are increased to n instead of 2, then we get the equation for capital X is given by m1 x1 plus m2 x2 plus etc etc up to mn xn divided by m1 plus m2 plus mn. This can be written as sigma i is equal to 1 to n of mi xi divided by sigma i equals 1 to n of mi or it can be simply written as sigma mi xi divided by mi using our usual mathematical representations. Here sigma small mi equal to total capital M that is the total mass of the system. So the denominator here is capital M mass of the system itself. The center of mass of C, C, C mass the center of the mass C of the system of n particles is defined and located by the coordinate three coordinates x, y and z which is given by x is equal to sigma m i x i divided by sigma m i as explained previously and it can also be written in integral form as 1 over capital M into integral X of dm. Here dm is the small mass of the system. So in the y co in y coordinate it will be written as sigma mi yi divided by sigma mi r equal to 1 over m into integral y into dm. Let it be equation 2. 
and the z axis in the z axis the center of the mass will be sigma mi z i divided by sigma mi that is equal to 1 over m into integral into z into dm in the integration integral form let it be equation 3 these three equations can be combined to one equation using notation of position vectors Let ri, small ri, vector ri is equal to small xi plus small yj plus small zk be the position vector of the ith particle. Here, i, j, k with caps are the unit vectors in the direction of x-axis, y-axis and z-axis respectively. Then, the position vector capital r, vector r of this center of the mass is given by the relation capital R vector is equal to capital Xi plus capital Yj plus capital Zk that can be written as sigma Mi Ri divided by capital M. Let it be equation 4. Often we come across center of mass of homogeneous bodies of regular shapes like rings, discs, spheres, rods, etc. Here in this example shown on the right hand side, the figure number 2, a rod is shown wherein we are required to determine the center of mass of this thin rod. Let us consider a thin rod whose width and breadth or radius is much smaller than its length. That is, the radius or cross section of this rod is very much lesser than the length of the rod. Length of the rod is extends from this left hand side to radius along <coughs> x axis. Taking the origin to be at the geometric center of the rod, this is the geometric center of the rod O. We can say that on account of reflection symmetry for every element dm at x, dm at x on the right hand side, there is an another element dm at a distance minus x. The net contribution of each and every pair to be the integral, hence the integral x dm itself is 0. Now, we will proceed to work out some examples of center of mass. Question number one. Find the center of mass of three particles at the vertices of an equilateral triangle as shown in figure A. The masses of particles are 100 grams, 150 grams, and 200 grams respectively. Each side of the equilateral triangle is 0 0.5 meters long. Let us solve it. From the figure, coordinates of equilateral triangle points are O, this is O, 0, 0, then A, this is the point A, that is 0 0.5 and 0 and B, this is the point B, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, square root of 3. This is by solving, by rearranging the coordinates as shown in figure A. O is 1 edge, A, B, C are 3 corners. Let the masses 100 grams, 150 grams, and 200 grams be located at O, A, and B respectively. This is 100 grams, A is 150 grams, and B is 200 grams. You please write the diagram along with me. Therefore, now we will find the coordinate x. We know the formula x is equal to m1x1 plus m2x2 plus m3x3 
divided by m plus m2 plus mn up to mn therefore or m3 that is equal to 100 into x is 0 here x1 is 0 150 into 0 0.5 plus 200 into 0 0.25 because we have marked the coordinates here divided by their weights m1 plus m2 plus m3 that is 100 grams plus 150 grams plus 200 grams simplifying we get the answer as x is equal to 5 divided by 18 now we will find the y coordinates y is equal to m1 y1 plus m2 y2 plus m3 y3 divided by m1 plus m2 plus m3 that is equal to 100 into 0 because here the coordinates of o are 0 0 therefore y is also 0 plus 150 0 that is on the x axis the y coordinate is 0 plus 200 into 0 0.25 into square root of 3 divided by 100 plus 150 plus 200. Simplifying, we get the answer y as 1 over 3 into square root of 3. The different calculation steps are also written horizontally, but you write it vertically down, one below the other. Thus, the center of mass C is shown in the figure. C is shown here. That is, x is 5 by 18, comma, and y is 1 over 3 root 3. This is the answer. Note that it is not the geometric center of the triangle OAB. Please note, because weights are differing at each vertices, so it is not the geometric center of the triangle OAB. Next example, question number two. Find the center of mass of a triangular lamina. Lamina is a flat, thin plate. Triangular lamina is shown in figure B. Answer, the lamina triangle L, M, N. This is L, M, N may be subdivided into narrow strips parallel to the base M, N. This is the base Mn and we are dividing it in a number of narrow strips as shown in the figure. By symmetry, each strip has its center of mass at its midpoint. If we join the midpoint of all the strips, we get the median Lp. See, we, we mark the center of each strip and we join them. That is Lp. The center of mass of triangle as a whole, therefore, has to be lie on the median P. Median LP. This is L and the P. Similarly, we can argue that it lies on the median MQ. So, if you join here MQ, MQ and NR. That is, you mark the center of LM as R and LN as Q and jo join MQ and NR, you will get that medians MQ and NR and the center of mass has to lie on that. This means that the center of mass lies on the point of concurrence of the median, medians, that is, on the centroid G of the triangle. So, if you join nr and mq and at the center g the said the center of mass lies at the point g next question find the center of mass of a uniform l shape lamina that is a thin flat plate is called lamina with dimensions as shown in the diagram below the mass of the lamina is 3 kg. So, you please say the given shapes are is shown in the figure. So, this is x axis, y x and this is y axis and it has got different coordinates. O is 0, 0 as you know where x is 0 and y is 0 
and it is given a is 2 comma 0 and similarly the point b is 2 comma 1 that is x is 2 and y is 1 and this is the point d its coordinates are 1 and 1 and this is the point e x is 1 and y is 2 and y f the point f which lies on the y axis is x is 0 comma y is 2 and the three parts of the l shape lamina are c1 c2 and c3 answer the centers of mass c1 c2 and c3 of the squares are by symmetry of their geometric centers have the coordinates half comma half 3 by 2 comma half 1 by 2 comma half so these are all given here that is if you take it this this is as 2 and this is 1 because of symmetrical c1 c2 and c3 are symmetrical three squares so their center points if you take it will be half and half geometrical half and half y is half x is half here it will be 3 by 2 and 1 by 2 and here it will be 1 by 2 and 3 by 2 respectively we take the masses of squares to be concentrated at these points the center of the mass of the whole shape capital X comma capital Y is the center of the mass of these mass points. Therefore, we can calculate X as using the previous formula M1 X1 plus M2 X2 plus M3 X3 divided by M1 plus M2 plus M3. So that is 1 into mass is 1 kg, 1 kg each because three parts are there. Each part will be 1 kg. 1 into 1 by 2 plus 1 into 3 by 2 plus 1 into 1 by half, 1 by 2 divided by 1 plus 1 plus 1. That is equal to 5 by 6 meters. Similarly, we can calculate the y coordinate of this lamina. Capital Y is equal to M1 Y1 plus M2 Y2 plus M3 Y3 divided by M1 plus M2 plus M3. So writing the, the values of, substituting the values of M1, M2, M3 and Y1, Y2, Y3 we get 1 into half plus 1 into half plus 1 into 3 by 2 divided by 1 plus 1 plus 1 that is equal to 5 by 6 meter so capital y is 5 by 6 meters and capital x also is 5 by 6 meters therefore the center of the mass of l shape lies on the line od that is od Next, we will summarize the important points about the center of mass. The position of center of mass is independent of the coordinate system chosen. So, wherever you go, it is the position of center of mass is independent of the coordinate system. The position of the mass depends on the shape of the body and the distribution of the mass. In the previous example, we have seen that position of the center mass depends only on the shape of the body and the distribution of the mass. Point number three, in symmetrical bodies in which the distribution of mass is homogeneous, the center of mass coincides with the geometrical center of the or the center of symmetry of the body. Please note the geometrical center and the center of mass coincide only in case of symmetrical bodies and mass is distributed homogeneously. The center of mass of the cone or pyramid lies on the axis of the cone at the point distance from the vertex where h is the height of the cone. The center of the mass changes its position only under the translatory, translatory motion. There is no effect of rotary motion on the center of the mass. This is also an important point. Please note, in the case of when the body 
performs translatory motion then its center of mass mass changes its position whereas it remains same in the case of a rotary motion point number 5 if the origin is at the center of the mass then some of the moments of the masses of the system about the center of mass is zero that is sigma mi ri equals zero next we will study about the motion of center of mass we know that position vector r of the center of mass is given by vector r is equal to summation m i r i divided by m that is small i r i is a vector therefore we can rewrite m into r cross multiplying m into r equals sigma m i r i that is equal to expanding m1 r1 plus m2 r2 plus etc etc up to mn rn let it be equation number 7 differentiating these two sides of equation 7 we get with respect to time m into dr by dt is equal to m1 into dr1 by dt plus m2 into dr2 by dt plus etc etc up to mn d of rn by dt therefore but we know that the position differential of position vector dr by dt is velocity therefore m into vector v velocity where v is the velocity equals m1 vector v1 into m2 v2 plus etc etc up to mn vn let it be equation 8 where vector v is equal to dr by dt is the velocity of the center of the mass now once again we will differentiate equation 8 to get the acceleration therefore m into dv by dt equals m1 into dv by v1 by dt plus m2 into dv2 by dt plus etc etc up to mn into dn d of vn by dt Hence, it becomes the left hand side dv by dt is capital A, acceleration of the mass. Therefore, m into A is equal to m1 A1 plus m2 A2 plus etc etc plus mn An. Let it be equation 9. Here, vector A is equal to dv by dt. That is, v vector v is the velocity and capital A is the acceleration of the center of the mass of the system. Please note it is the capital A is the acceleration of the center of the mass. Now from the Newton's second law, the force acting on the first article particle is given by vector we know from Newton's second law F is equal to M A, where F is the force, M is the mass, and A is the acceleration. A1 is the acceleration. This is only for considering the position of the one, one part of a mass of the body. Therefore, capital M into vector A equals vector F1 plus vector F2 plus etc. etc. plus vector Fn. Let it be equation 10. Thus, m into a is equal to f of f external that is force external force let it be equation 11 next we will study about the linear momentum of a system of particles this is given as section 7.4 in your ncrt textbooks We know that linear momentum of particle is defined as P equals M into V, 
where vector p small p is the momentum this is linear momentum m is the mass and vector v is the velocity let this be equation 12 from newton's second law for a single particle we know that force f equals dp by dt let it be equation 13 here f is the force on the particle Consider a system of particles with mass m1, m2, etc. up to mn respectively and velocities v1, v2 up to vn respectively. The particles may be interacting and having external forces acting on them. The linear momentum of the first particle is m1, v1. Of the second particle is m2, v2 and so on. For the system of n particles, the linear momentum of the system is defined to be the vector sum of all the individual particles of the system. Therefore, capital P, the linear momentum of the system, equals momentum of the individual particles, that is small p1, vector p1, plus vector small p2, plus etc., etc., up to vector small pn. It can be written as capital P is equal to m1 v1 plus m1 into v2 plus etc etc into mn vn. Comparing the equation 8, we get capital P is equal to capital M into capital V, where capital P is the momentum of the system of particles, M is the mass of the system of particles and capital V vector V is the velocity of the system of particles. Let it be equation 15. Thus, the total momentum of a system of particles is equal to the product of the total mass of the system and velocity of its center of mass. Now we proceed further and differentiate the equation 15. Therefore, dp by dt with respect to time, that is dp by dt equals capital M into dv by dt. Here, capital V is the ve velocity vector of the system of particles. But dv by dt, as we know, is vector A, that is acceleration, M into A. Let it be equation 16. Comparing equation 16 and equation 11 in the previous slide, we get dp by dt is equal to f of external, f external, that is external force. Right hand side is external force, left hand side is the differential of the momentum of the system of particles. Let it be equation 17. This is the statement of the Newton's second law extended to a system of particles. Previously, we had defined it with respect to a single particle. In this equation 17, we have given the statement of Newton's second law of motion, which is extended to system of particles. Suppose the, the sum of the external forces acting on the system of particle is zero, then the right hand side becomes zero. Right hand side of equation 17 becomes zero. Therefore, dp by dt will be equal to zero, which is possible only if momentum capital P vector capital P equals a constant. So differential of a constant is zero. Let it be equation 18a. Now we will draw the conclusions of momentum of a system of particles. When the external force acting on a system of particles is zero, the total linear momentum of the system is constant. 
So I, if they, that is, we have seen in the previous slide, when f external is zero, momentum is constant. This is the law of conservation of total linear momentum of a system of particles. In equation 15, it also means that when the total external force on the system is zero, the velocity of the center of mass remains constant. The forces exerted by particles on one another, that is the internal forces, the individual particles may have complicated trajectories. Yet, if the total external force acting on the system is zero, the center of mass moves with a constant velocity, that is, moves uniformly in a straight line, like a free particle. The vector equation 18A in three scalar equations can also be written as capital P of X, that is along X axis equal to C1, constant one, capital P along Y axis equal to C2, and capital P, that is momentum along Z axis is C3. Let it be equation 18B. Here, P suffix X, PY, and PZ are the components of total linear momentum of vector P along X, Y, and Z axis respectively. And C1, C2, and C3 are constant. With this, we conclude our preliminary discussions on section 7.1, 7 7.2, 7.3, and 7.4 of system of particles and rotational motion. Our next lecture will be on vector product of two vectors, angular velocity and its relation with linear velocity, torque and angular momentum. Till then, goodbye.